welcome to the episode. Uh, this is Russ, and I'm glad you're with me. And we're going to do a quick review today on how I'm doing with the work on the boat. She's looking pretty good, and we're making progress. So first, let's start with the toilet. Okay, we're up here in the head. That's currently my storage area. This is the new toilet and it is going to be the tallest toilet on the planet there's no other place to put it it won't fit on that flat part there because that's triangular shape and it is a square shape i guess i have the option of cutting away that built-in fiberglass shelf that the old toilet was mounted on i guess i could grind that away and kind of build a flat floor over but it really won't gain me much space because of the curvature of the hull. It would only gain me about two inches of horizontal space and then the toilet would stick out even further. So <clears throat> right now we're planning on a toilet on a pedestal. Make a goal, a true throne. So and I just made this out of the uh, <laughs> the old political signboards that I got from Ron and uh, kind of just experimenting with what shapes I would want to kind of adapt to the existing layout. Rather than cutting the... Rather than trying to muscle a piece of plywood around and make trial and error type cuts, you, it's much better to make a template using paper, cardboard, or what I've recently been put onto by my friend Ron is uh, old political signs. And when you finally got the design and the shape you like, then you get busy cutting the, pl the plywood. That's the plan. Okay. Let's go cut it. Not bad. Not bad. We need two of these. Let's cut the so I made the shelf out of two separate pieces of half inch plywood and that you can see I attached them together with screws and epoxy before I made any cuts. That way you only have to cut once and they line up perfectly. Okay, we're in like step 27 for this thing. This is a shelf on which the toilet, right there, is going to be mounted. And of course this is just fabric. In fact, this fabric is uh, one of the remnants of my old stay cell. In fact, it makes an excellent drop cloth. But the uh, this is a third and final coat of epoxy. And I used pigment this time. Battleship gray powdered pigment just to see how well it covered and if it affected cure time or anything like that. And it doesn't seem to. So really, that was very successful, but... But indeed, is this is the old galley and this has been my focus. So it was an old double fridge and I showed you last week some of the construction work I did to get out of the uh, current situation, which is cooking on the floor with this contrivance I made from an old salvage stove top and liquid or solid alcohol fuel underneath. Now those things did work, but I have made a lot of progress, so I've got a bunch of uh, plywood and about seven layers of fiberglass cloth and a lot of epoxy and then the fairing uh, material to get it smooth. So in the galley this area is complete to the point that it's ready for a skim coat of epoxy and then start doing the gel coat so which really means sand it really good then the epoxy sand it some more then the gel coat time and I haven't even bought the gel coat and again, since it's raining today, I'm probably not going to be bicycling anywhere until the next day or two. But that's fine. I want to secure it a little bit more. It'll be hard as a rock. I put the shelf in, and you're thinking, what the hell for? Well, there's going to be a backboard going here, and I got it all trimmed up. But this uh, is going to be the backboard, and this is going to end up being, and there'll be a sheet of plywood, half inch thick, that goes all the way to here, and then a piece of Sapelli lumber one by eight so that's going to go up and I'll make basically a box with a shelf in it to provide storage for people from, in the, from the cockpit's view. So you can reach in, throw things under the kitchen counter, but if somebody's over here cooking, you don't want all that shit getting on the food, right? So this is clean zone, this is cockpit zone, and that's the way I want to do it. 
So the stove is there, it's physically installed, it's all gimbaled up, it's all ready to go, except I don't have any propane yet. I know where I'm going to get the propane, all I need now is a set of wheels to go get it. Okay, so, done already. That was only about 10 minutes off camera. And frankly, um, <laughs> I'm not impressed. <laughs> oh, what a shitty looking counter. Oh, so to my girlfriend who's out there, look at our beautiful kitchen counter. So, it's ugly. Some kind of translucent, mustardy, gold color. And it looks, I mean, I can only see the color over the white background. But over this black stuff, it, this old gel coat, which was heavily sanded and acetone. In some cases, it doesn't even want to stick. You can see, see, you can see it's kind of beating up almost, and that's no good. But the whole idea of this is to kind of give a skim coat. And this is the galley counter at the moment, okay? This is after my skim coats of varnish and, not varnish, uh, epoxy. And then I mixed a, a tinting agent to make a nice chocolate brown color. Um, and it's probably hard to see, but I'm experimenting with a little bit of color. And I'm going to do that for the top coat. When I do the second coat in another day or so, I mean, it's kind of dry to the touch now, but not, it's not definitely not cured. I'm going to let it cure, then I have to sand it, then wipe it down again, and then hit it with another coat, and then I'll finally, finally, finally be done. I also built this shelving unit, which doesn't have a top yet, and that's to store things as reached from the cockpit. So that came out pretty good. Um, and on that piece, I'm pretty happy with the way that turned out. Up in the bathroom, up in the head. I've got my toilet installed. Okay, so this is a new composting head, like a litter box for people. And I put the uh, similar type of uh, tabletop epoxy on the deck. I, I need to put in the drain. And as soon as I get some plumber's putty, I'll put that in. So I built this shelf to hold the toilet, so we have a very high elevation toilet, but it should be okay. And up here is still a sit-down shower. The only problem is, and I haven't dealt with it yet, but on the edges, because I use masking tape, and you can see how the, the epoxy absolutely overpowers the masking tape's ability to, to provide a seal. So all along the edges, the the epoxy kind of oozed up underneath the tape so i've got a bit of a cleanup job because i mean it looks awful right now and we can't have that so it, it, i mean it looks terrible but but functionally it's almost done i mean because i i mean I, I'm, I'm standing on it now and and it's nice and shiny and clean and it's going to be easy to clean and um, all the dirty stains and stuff are now um, buried deep under three layers of epoxy. So, and this is my toilet. So, this is an Ogo toilet. So, pretty cool. I mean, I, I think that'll be fine. I, I haven't installed the ventilation fan yet, but one of these days I'll probably get to that. Well, the good thing about epoxy is that once you work it for about 20 minutes, you just have to walk away. <laughs> and I don't know if you guys think this is horridly ugly. But it's kind of what I wanted. This is a good time to interrupt myself and tell you a couple of items. First, the reason that little plug is not installed in the freezer is because epoxy is not yet cured. And they would otherwise just fuse together forever. The second thing is that I never use gel coat. That's not gel coat. That's epoxy as well. That's the same tabletop epoxy they call it with a lot of tinting. And the reason is gel coat is basically a vinyl ester slash polyester resin and it does not stick to epoxy. So gel coat would go over top of all gel coat but it would not go over epoxy. So that's why I did what I did. Now there's nothing to do but walk away from it and uh, get off the boat for a little while and maybe take a walk around the marina. That's what I'm going to go do. Ahí va a salir, va a salir, va a salir. Ahí va a salir, va a salir, a huevo. Can't see a damn thing. <laughs> they went deep just as I take a picture. They're coming towards you now, but they're deep.
sure do. Hey there, so it's April 7, and kind of a, it's a, a low pressure system day where we've had a system blow through today, and that's what it looks like out there right now. I mean, not, not awful, I mean, not awful, it rained a few hours, but not too bad. The problem for me right now, in a practical sense, is the water. The water is kind of got this tea color because when it rains heavily, all the runoff from everywhere in St. Petersburg comes running into the sea, of course, and it come, passes by the marina on its way to the sea. One good tidal cycle will fix that, but in the meantime, the water is so cloudy and so dirty that I can't see down there. And you're thinking, well, why does that matter? Well, it matters because there's something down there that I want. Um, that, that is that yellow rack is where the outboard motor goes and that motor is currently at the bottom of the sea and that's like you've heard the sayings before you know for a, a hundred attaboys you get one aw shit and this was my aw shit and it's my own fault I don't have anybody to blame except myself and I, was, I think the root cause is that I've been trying to do so many things here that I had the cockpit looking like this <clears throat> just a mess of stuff and I was reaching down to get the motor out of the dinghy after using it and I lost my footing up here in the deck and I lost my grip on the on the outboard and I ended up grabbing only the handle which slid right off of course and I watched the outboard bounce against the dinghy and then fall down and, and I just couldn't get it and that happened yesterday around 6 30 p.m. and the sun was so low in the sky that I couldn't see anything down there I jumped in right away. I, mean, I, I knew exactly where it was. I did feel it though. I drove down there to it. It's about 12 foot down and for this old guy that's far enough for me to be going without a, a scuba tank because I have to just hold my breath of course and when you're holding your breath it makes you more buoyant so you have to struggle to keep down there so you have to exhale all your air to stay down and then of course you, you run out of air so 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 I couldn't get the outboard up and uh, I moved it I got a line on it, but then as I got it about halfway up, it fell down just like the Kursk. And so now it's been about 18 hours and the outboard is probably now trash. It's, I did a little bit of reading online thinking just how long can a motor last under salt water before it's completely toast and so it's like fuck, you know. It's a thousand dollars, you know, it's, a, it's an expensive motor and I just be, um, I wouldn't call it carelessness. I mean, you might call it complacency, you might call it trying to do too much or whatever to being distracted there's probably a lot of things I had gone running earlier that day so I was so tired I don't know bottom line is stupid and I did it to myself and there's nobody else to blame except this guy and now I don't have an outboard and I'm gonna try tomorrow when the sun's up when we get a sunny sky that's straight up on top and the water clears out I'll go down and I'll, I'll fish up whatever's down there but it's probably not gonna be recoverable so I'm gonna... <laughs> Don't oh, water on my camera. Okay, so what are we looking at? Freaking motor, but no water. I've seen this on other YouTube channels. <laughs> Never thought I'd do it. Oh, the the amount of black shit water that came out of this cowling, I guess from up from up under there. So I'll take the cowling off. I'm just gonna hose it all down. It's possible that it could be recovered. It's possible. I don't know. I don't know much about outboards, to be honest. But I mean, this end is made to go into water, so I'm not worried about that. I mean, I could change the lower unit oil. Mostly it's getting this cowling off and then finding a place where the air filter is and any place where the air comes in is where the water went in, so we'll see. We'll make an attempt at recovering. God damn it. Well, thank you for watching the video and good morning. It's uh, 6.25 a.m. It's still dark outside, but that's fine. And I'm going to get to work. I got a busy, busy couple of days ahead of me. Um, <clears throat> 
the first thing is my son's wedding is this weekend okay so that's priority second thing is I've got uh, I found the new dinghy I'm gonna buy a new dinghy and get rid of Pugsley and actually gonna sell it back to Chris uh, who I got it from in the first place and um, um, and I'm gonna be helping somebody today with their uh, diesel engine and then I have to go pay the sale maker so um, there's a lot of things that I need to do um, aside from personal items and uh, I'll just point out that the outboard motor, I, I did recover it actually. I, I took it all apart. Well, that, no, that's not correct. I took off the cowling and I took off the bowl of the carburetor and that's about all I really disassembled. And I, I actually squirted uh, fresh water directly into the air intake on the carb until I got clean water coming out the bowl and I thought, well, that's about as good as I can do. <coughs> and then I popped off the spark plug to see if anything came out, but the cylinder didn't have any nasty water at all. It was just nice and fresh oily like it's supposed to be. So I put it all back together and this thing started right up. And it's amazing. And I've run the motor twice now for about a total of an hour in, a, in the marina, just running high speed, low speed, and it seems to be no worse for the wear. And I, if anybody out there has any thoughts on what else I can do. I'm worried about the pull start mechanism, the little clutch on the top that you crank it with, because I, I couldn't get any good squirting of fresh water to rinse it down, and I just don't know if there's more that I can do, or maybe it'll be just fine. So I, it's just fine right now, and uh, that'll be fine, I guess. But uh, with the new dinghy, which will be a lot bigger, probably my little two horse outboard isn't going to be good enough anyway. So I might be ending up buying another outboard anyhow but I won't do that for a while because if I buy an outboard it's going to be a two-stroke and those are hard to find in the U.S. in fact I think they're illegal so I'll buy another outboard when I get further south but that's a lot of talking um let's see what else I, I took a, I paid a visit to the sail maker who's right here in St. Petersburg and I had a great visit I'll make a special episode that'll follow this one almost immediately I can put that video together in probably an hour and so that, that was fascinating. My mainsail is under production right now. The staysail also. I think the main is going to be done first and then she's going to sew up the uh, staysail. And it was fascinating to look at how uh, Tom you know, does the calculations and how he uses available drawings to determine the exact sail dimensions. So that was very instructive for me and I'm happy for that. So I should have new sails next week. Um, and I've also been doing a lot of fill-in work, so I, I, I mean, it's all over the place. But it's one of them was fixing a leak topside. I, during the last rainstorm, I noticed I had a leak from where one of the fair leads had been. So that was an easy fix. I'm also doing a lot of stowage for sea inside the boat. So, now the boats, and most boats, don't have a place to store a lot of things that you need to have. And so I am tired of things rolling around the cabin in my last trip up from Mexico my cooler flipped upside down and broke all my eggs and my beer and all that stuff and you know that ain't gonna happen anymore so I'm gonna stow this baby for sea so that I can take 50 60 degree rolls and nothing is gonna move but it just takes time excellent fill-in work because I, I kinda get a design in my head and I can just work it an hour at a time as uh, you know as I'm waiting for epoxy to cure stuff like that and you jump on another job so, um, this weekend is busy. Um, next weekend, I next week I should maybe possibly uh, get into the boatyard. And if he won't get me in this week, then I'm going to say to hell with it. And I'll just live with the risk until I get over to the east coast of Florida. There's a boatyard over there that will do it and let me live aboard and let me do my own work. So, we'll just see. If, if possible, I'll get the boat hauled out next week. That would be great. And next week I should also get my main sail and my stay sail put on. And I'll run my new halyard at that time. It's going to be a pretty big couple of weeks. And I think by the end of April this boat ought to be ready to move. You know, And I'll just be back down to my normal projects like DC Electrical. Which I still haven't done. <laughs> so, um, it's, uh, it still looks like it looks and I need to go buy the breakers. Because it's very possible I'll be doing that job while I'm on the move somewhere. So that's kind of the way I see this shaking out. So, 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 
I do appreciate everybody who watches, and I do appreciate your comments a lot. It really does help me a lot. So um, I, I've got tons of work to do on the boat, but I don't want to work on it frenetically anymore. I just want to, you know, kind of chug along, give the boat about six to eight hours of my time a day, and then, you know, try to stay in shape and relax and, you know, basically you know, load up on supplies because I'm going to be shoving off again as soon as I get the boat ready to go. I like to do a little bit of sailing down the Keys before the hurricane season hits, so so we'll see. But for that, for now, um, take care, everybody. Bye.